My name is Chris Chang and I am History Channel's Top Shot Season 4 Champion and author of a book for beginning marksmen called Shoot to Win. Let me tell you a little bit about my background since it ties into my talk for today. So I'm three years into the firearms industry and before coming into the industry I worked for Google in Mountain View, California and headquarters and my entry into, into the firearms industry was due to winning Top Shot. It was uh, an amazing experience, uh, shooting some great weapons and blowing stuff up. Uh, my introduction to firearms was my father taught me how to shoot at the age of six. And I grew up in Southern California in Orange County and uh, had a lot of you know, great you know, memories shooting with my father. But it wasn't something that we did all the time shot maybe once every three or four years, punch some holes in paper, and the guns go back in the safe. And so when I was working at Google, the show called Top Shot on the History Channel you know, started airing, and uh, I had this crazy, audacious idea that someone like me, a self-taught amateur who was a, a nobody in the shooting world, could somehow hold his own against 17 of the world's best shooters. Through lots of training, I ended up winning Top Shot, $100,000 cash prize, and a professional shooting contract with Bass Pro Shops. And I tell you all this because for me, even though I'm three years in the industry, you know, I still think of myself as, as a little bit of an outsider. And over the past three years, I've been taking a look at the trends of what I've seen happen in the past and where I think our industry should be going, which is what I want to talk to you about today. And uh, before I get into uh, you know, the, the meat and potatoes of the content, you know, I'm so thankful for you know, the opportunity that our country and this industry has provided for me because I don't think my story could have happened in any other country in the world where a, a self-taught amateur could go onto a TV show and you know, win a, a, a good grip of money and quit Google and go into the firearms industry. So uh, a very quick thank you to everyone in this room um, and everyone in our industry and everyone that supports the Second Amendment for, uh, for, for my success. So here's what I want to talk to you about today. Where we've been and where we're going. Quickly define diversity and talk about why it's important a very brief overview on the changing demographics, something that we talked about this morning. And then the meat and potatoes of my talk today is going to be story time. So go ahead and you know, get your popcorn popped and uh, you know, get ready for, for two stories. And then I want to conclude with a call to action. So let's talk about where we've been and where we're going. When I came into the industry in 2012, it was in the middle of the AR-15 rising to become America's number one rifle. In 2015, we're starting to see that sales line starting to flatten out, and so the question is, right, where do we go next? But from my perspective, and, uh, and obviously we, we've seen what the sales numbers look like for the AR-15. Another trend that we've seen over the past few years is the tremendous success in the women's demographic. The NRA has the NRA Women's Network, and we have tremendous support from the industry, and here we have Smith & Wesson, who is sponsoring the NRA Women's Network. The National Shooting Sports Foundation has a fantastic infographic that they call Girl Power. One quick little snippet from that infographic. On the top line, we have seen that women hunters have gone from 1.8 million in 2001 all the way to 3.3 million female hunters in 2013, increase of 85%. On that bottom line, when we were talking about women target shooters, during that same time frame, 3.3 million to 5.4 million, a 60% increase. So we have seen a dramatic increase and in flattening out of AR-15 sales, not just AR-15s, but, but firearms in general. We've seen tremendous success with our industry focusing on women instead of you know, branching out beyond that was uh, the, the pale, uh, pale, male, and what was the other third? Stale. Pale, stale, and male demographic that we heard about this morning, which is really, uh, really uh, a great way to kind of summarize uh, you know, where we've been. And so, of course, it begs the question, where are we going? 
And for those of you familiar with Wayne Gretzky, famous hockey player, had a, has a really great quote, to skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. I've seen this industry seem to continue to skate back to where the puck has been, to focus on that, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting the three things, right? the, the, the pale, stale, male <laughs> demographic, the old, the, old, the, old, the old white guy to, to summarize. And uh, you know, that, that is, that's fine, but if we want to expand our reach and bring in new shooters and new gun owners and new Second Amendment advocates, we have to change our strategy. And so for me, the, where the puck is going is our industry focusing on diversity. Now, why is, what is diversity and why is it important? Uh, diversity can mean a lot of different things. It can mean religion, gender identity, sexual orientation, or disability status. But for the context of today's talk, we're talking about ethnicities, like we've been talking about for most of the day, Hispanics, Asians, whites, blacks. Now, this is important because in the context of America, we are a country of immigrants. America has always been a beacon of hope and promise. And I think it's really understand for us to think about where do firearms fit in the context of an immigrant mindset? Immigrants do not come to America to shoot guns. <laughs> right? And you don't hear people say, I'm going to move from China because I want to you know, come to America to shoot guns. No, they, people come to America for economic opportunity, for a better jobs, for a better life. So using that as a baseline of understanding, we then have to understand that a lot of immigrant families do not have traditions of firearms ownership, of hunting, of sport shooting. And therein lies the opportunity for us to promote the Second Amendment, to promote hunting and sport shooting to these new, this new demographic and make them a multi-generational customer and a lifelong Second Amendment advocate. To briefly review the change in demographics, year 2000, whites are, you know, a, were a, a majority at 69.1%. Flash forward to 2010, whites still majority, but that, that slice of the pie is decreasing. And so this highlighted yellow section is increasing. And then as we heard this morning, by 2050, that yellow segment is going to become the majority, and so whites will still be a minority, but um, they will be the largest minority. But it's important to note that minority groups are the fastest growing segments in the United States. All right, so story time. Um, we all know that stories are a great way to make your point to compel people to action. And I want to tell you two stories in the Asian American community that, that I think resonate really strongly, uh, not just with myself, but with uh, you know, millions of other Americans out there. The first story takes us to Los Angeles, and this is 1992. This is not a bonfire. There are no s'mores and, and uh, you know, steaks being cooked on this. This is, this is a riot. This is a fire happening in downtown Los Angeles, and this is the Rodney King riots. And really quick, Rodney King was an African-American man who was beat by four white police officers, and the jury acquitted the four officers of the crime. After that acquittal, LA broke out into riots. You saw the streets burning, uh, just total mayhem. LAPD was overwhelmed and understaffed. You had businesses who were blockading their storefronts. You see a bunch of furniture here and cars parked in front of the business. And so I want to zero in on Koreatown. And right now we're looking at a Korean business. Now, the Koreans had contacted LAPD because they knew that the riots were coming to Koreatown. And they said, you know, dial 911. Hey, you know, we need help in Koreatown. The riots are coming. And LAPD said, probably one of the things that you would never imagine 911 telling you. Sorry, 
you're on your own. So the Koreans, in probably a worst case situation ever, they had to rely on the Second Amendment and their own personal firearms to protect their property and their lives. And so if you look at the upper right hand corner of this picture, you're going to see men on the top of the building armed with guns. And these aren't police officers. These are, these are Americans, just American civilians armed with guns, exercising their Second Amendment rights to protect themselves when the government wasn't there to protect them. Koreatown sustained a fair amount of damage, but it can be argued that they didn't sustain as much damage as you know, would have happened had they not had their own personal firearms to protect themselves. And I think this is a very compelling story for Asian Americans, showing them the value of the Second Amendment and taking personal responsibility for your safety and protecting what is valuable to you. The second story and final story I want to tell you about is my friend Vera Ku. So Vera is a Chinese-American woman who lives in Menlo Park, which is in Silicon Valley. Uh, she didn't shoot her first gun until the age of 41. Since shooting her, gun, you know, the, her first gun at the age of 41, she has become a two-time international pistol champion and eight-time Bianchi Cup champion. Vera is just such an amazing person and a fantastic inspiration. And I want to tell you one very quick story about what she calls her warrior mindset. Uh, when she was training for the 2013 Bianchi Cup, she got injured on the range. Long story short, she was the last person there, private range, no one else is there but her. She tripped over a rope and she ended up breaking her leg. Her cell phone was in her car 25 yards away. It was 40 degrees out, it was cold, it was raining. You know, she didn't know she broke her leg at the time since it was so cold. She had three layers of wool socks and thick clothes. She thought, you know, maybe it was just a really bad sprain, but bottom line was she knew no one was gonna come help her because her phone's in the car and nobody knew that she was in trouble. With a broken leg and laying on gravel at the range, she dragged herself to the car and she told me that she had set small goals for herself. One foot, I'm gonna drag myself one foot closer to my car. She dragged herself one foot, then it was okay, another foot, and then another foot. Okay, three feet this time. And eventually she made it to her car and uh, she recovered in, in, a, you know, in a very, very fast amount of time. Uh, she ate, I think she told me, two eight ounce steaks every single day as part of her recovery period, and uh, she's just such an amazing, strong person, and I think someone who is very inspiring, not just for the Asian American community, but for any of us who are either gun owners or competitive shooters, and believe it or not, she's 68 years old, and she still looks like this, which is pretty incredible. So these two stories about the LAPD riots in Koreatown and, and Vera, Vera Ku, are, uh, I think, just you know, two of the many, you know, the thousands of examples out there of, of successes and inspirations you know, happening in the Asian American community. And obviously, there, there's plenty more stories in, in the black community and the Hispanic community. And so I want to end and conclude here with a, a call to action. Number one, I would love to see more targeted messaging towards ethnic groups. We've been talking a lot about that today. Number two, sponsoring or attending diversity events such as the NSSF First Shots program. If you're not familiar with First Shots, uh, check it out. It's Tisma Jewett here. Uh, Tisma, who works for the NSS NSSF, she's uh, the manager of First Shots, and it it's an amazing program and uh, please get involved with that if, uh, if you have a chance. And then finally, highlight people of color in firearm ads, media articles, and other marketing collateral. And so to summarize, we talked about how you know, women's outreach has been hugely successful, but there's so much more opportunity. Ethnic and racial minorities compose of 33% of America's population, but that is increasing. And diversity is the next area of success for our industry. 
Thank you so much for listening today. And if uh, you have any questions, I'm, I'm here you know, throughout lunch tomorrow. Uh, you can also contact me on my website at topshotchris.com. Thank you so much.